I'm really delighted to announce that we now have an event talking about building resilience post COVID-19. We're looking for ways to adapt to disaster that we've all seen over the course of the last couple of months, uncertainty, and to find ways that we can build a systematic approach towards working together and making a stronger system coming out of this crisis. If you would like to um, tweet about the event, we would be very grateful if you were able to do so on the COGX Twitter handle, which is at COGX2020. Also for the Institute for the Future of Work, which is at underscore future of work. If you want to know more about the Future of Work Institute, um, please go on the website, ifow.org, where you can also sign up to the monthly newsletter, which has all of these kinds of information uh, on a regular basis. Finally, uh, for those who would like to ask questions, and I'm sure that there will be lots of questions arising from such an important topic, please go on Slido and input the code hashtag V66. That's hashtag V66. Um, and then we will make sure to try and get to all of your questions in the Q&A after the session. But now I'm absolutely delighted to hand over to Anthony O'Sullivan, um, who will be our moderator for this session to kick off. Thank you, Nyasha. Good afternoon to everyone. So I'm Anthony O'Sullivan, Partner and Director at White Shield Partners, which is a global public policy and advisory firm, uh, which focuses mainly on uh, the topic of uh, labor market resilience. And in fact, we uh, publish every year a uh, piece of benchmarking of countries, which is called the Global Labor Resilience Index, done in partnership with the uh, Oxford Side Business School Manpower Group and the uh, Institute for the Future of Work, which was uh, cited by uh, Nyasha. Um, now, just a few uh, numbers to put things in context here before we turn to our esteemed uh, panelists. Um, when we're looking at resilience, which we define as uh, the capacity to bounce back from, from shocks, uh, a certain form of toughness, um, there are basically different levels we're looking at resilience at. One is the country level, there's the firm level, and there is the individual level. And so all three are important. And if you put this in the context of a few numbers, at the individual level right now, in the United States, we have 40, more than 42 million jobless uh, claims since March, uh, which is roughly 25% of the labor force. And this is a country which was at the start of the year was at 3.5% uh, unemployment uh, rate, and that was the lowest in, in 50 years. So there's a shock at the, at the individual, at the worker level, as an example. Um, at the firm level, globally, we're facing a situation in which we're looking at a record number of, uh, of defaults. The credit ratings have gone down, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. And there's a huge risk of default for a number of companies. And in particular, sectors which are most affected, um, um, including apparel sector, obviously the aviation uh, uh, sector, uh, retail, tourism, and, and, and many others. And then if we look at the country level, we have uh, estimations recently from the IMF updated, which is we're facing a, a recession of minus 3% at the global level, minus 3%, and that's compared to 5% global growth uh, last year. So at the individual level, at the corporate <coughs> level, at the country level, we face uh, serious resilience uh, challenges. Now, I want to share um, a couple of, of, of um, pictures with you before we we, we kick off. Um, and uh, the first re relates to the, the Global Labor Resilience Index uh, structure and, 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 and a couple of messages behind it. Uh, first, uh, a fundamental cross-cutting message by this work, the Global Labor Resilience Index, is the need for a comprehensive approach to thinking about resilience. Now, the framework for the index itself reflects this. We're looking at structural and policy factors which are all interconnected when you're talking about resilience. So, for example, on the structural side, when you're looking at country-level resilience, you need to be thinking about demographics. You need to be looking at the level of economic development and, uh, and capabilities, which are defined by your relative um, uh, um, uh, capabilities and exports, namely. You need to be looking at level of economic diversification of the country, the level of inequality, 
And in addition, as we saw it with COVID-19, the importance of healthcare systems. So that's all the, the, the structural elements that, that are important. At the policy level, um, there's a tendency to focus on education and, and skills on the one hand, employment, so labor policy, innovation policy, technology infrastructure policy, entrepreneurship, and even statistics, because you can't improve what you can't uh, measure. And we're seeing actually statistics are one of the particular uh, issues right now in the midst of the COVID uh, crisis, whether it's health statistics, labor statistics, or, or other. So you can't just have um, one of these dimensions. It's not just a question of addressing to a Ministry of Employment or a Ministry of Education. You see, we need to have a really comprehensive approach to building resilience, whether it's at the country, corporate, or, or individual level. A second overarching message from the GLRI is the need for a paradigm shift. And we refer to this in January uh, when it was launched in, in Davos, and that was right before you know, the COVID-19 was, was, was starting to, to really expand. And it's become even more relevant now, where we see there's a need to move uh, to a societal approach where people come first. So we're moving from an economy-centric policies to citizen-centric policies. We, we, we need to be moving from a national sort of top-down centralized economy approach to more of a decentralized regional economy approach where there's benefits uh, for all. And all increasingly important is this notion of trust. Trust working within government and with, with business. And so to, to complement this top-down policy making with bottom-up, more inclusive uh, uh, policy making involving the different actors, government actors, business actors, and, uh, and, and citizens. And we see from uh, the recent poll that came out today from the Institute for the Future of Work, how important it is for individual workers to be involved in the solutions. There's a real fear right now, which is uh, blocking uh, uh, progress and partly because workers are not involved enough in, in, in any solutions at the firm level and at the, at the country at the country level. So those are a few a few thoughts to to, to kick things off uh, um, with the, the, the panel. And we have um, um, an esteemed group here um, representing different aspects with, of, of resilience, which are um, in, in, very important. Um, the first is uh, is Kay Firth Butterfield, who's head of um, 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 AI um, and machine learning at the World Economic Forum, and is going to first give us the perspective, the, the technology perspective, if we want, uh, from uh, resilience. So, uh, Kay, please, without further ado, if you could share your thoughts with us. Certainly, and I have a slideshow, and I think that COGX will throw up the first slide for us. Thank you. So the title of my talk is How do we use AI to reset post COVID-19? And obviously thinking about um, resilience in this context. As Anthony said, uh, we have been thinking about resilience a great deal at the World Economic Forum. And if we go to the next slide, just last week, Professor Schwab talked about the Great Reset. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, just to, I can't have the next slide. Uh, okay, so the Great Reset is necessary to build a new social contract that honors the dignity of every human being. And that's what Anthony was talking about when he said we need to have everybody involved in this. And just a couple of quotes here from um, Professor Schwab, the global health crisis has laid bare the unsustainability of our old system in terms of social cohesion, the lack of equal opportunity and inclusiveness. We cannot turn our backs on the evil, nor can we turn our backs on the evil of ra racism and discrimination. We need to build into this new social contract our intergenerational responsibility to ensure that we live up to the expectations of young people. COVID-19 has accelerated our transition into the age of the fourth industrial revolution. 
We have to make sure that the new technologies in the digital, biological and physical world remain human centered and serve society as a whole, providing everyone with fair access. And if we can move on to the next slide, uh, Prince Charles also commented last week as part of this great reset, which we are at the forum thinking of as a global society, as a community of common interest. Can I have the next slide, please? And Prince Charles said, in order to secure our future and to prosper, we need to evolve our economic model and put people and the planet at the heart of global value creation. If there is one critical lesson to learn from this crisis, it is that we need to put nature at the heart of how we operate. We simply can't waste more time. And obviously we agree, we need to move on. And next slide. Um, and we've already been putting some of this stuff in motion. So very quickly, there are four centers for the fourth industrial revolution that the World Economic Forum runs. I live in San Francisco. So San Francisco, India, China, and Japan. And we have affiliate centers all around the world, Colombia, South Africa, Rwanda, et cetera. Next slide, please. What do we do out of those? Well, what we do is governance of AI. And we feel that with, without governance of AI, we cannot be resilient in all the uses that we're going to put AI to. And I say on this slide that every company will become an AI company. And I firmly believe that. So we're not just talking about tech, we're talking about all the various places that the tech, AI, will be used. In Silicon Valley, we're talking about the fact that we have had two years worth of improvement in the technology in just two months. And obviously, Anthony mentioned the minus 3% uh, global forecast by the IMF. AI has the potential to help us overcome some of that and um, perhaps get to that 15 trillion value do dollar value of AI by 2030. I actually believe that companies that survive the COVID crisis will A, become AI companies, but it's not enough to become an AI company. You have to become a trusted AI company, and that takes me back to what Anthony was saying at the beginning. Next slide, please. So what I'm saying is that ethics has never been more important. If you're thinking about ethics and ethics really annoys you, think just about the word problems. What we're trying to solve are the problems that we see in AI at the moment. And I don't think you can avoid it. Over 175 organizations now have ethical principles. And if you think, uh, four of those that I just named, they are governments. So um, when governments start to think about it, then you as business owners and users of AI have to definitely think about it. And without trust, we were seeing tech clash. And so we need to have resilience in the way that we build AI in a trustworthy fashion. PwC's 2020 predictions had already taken the use of AI down from 2019 at 20% to 4% for 2020. And that was because of tech clash. And uh, that was before COVID. And if we look at the COVID tracking apps, clearly people don't trust them, even if they haven't got AI in them. And um, so you can see that 84% and 88 of Americans and 88% of Europeans believe that we have to carefully manage AI. So that's that trust thing again. If we go to the next slide, we can see that we really need human-centered design. If just, you know, if you don't believe in ethics, just to get this technology right. Gartner says by 2022, 85% of AI projects will deliver erroneous outcomes due to bias. So um, then we need to move on to the next slide. Um, and I want to talk about something that we launched today with the UK government. 
governments can be very important for resilience and artificial intelligence. We've been working with the UK government over 18 months and we have co-created guidelines and a workbook which governments can, be, can use to procure trusted AI. We worked also with obviously other countries because it's a multi-stakeholder effort and um, the framework enables governments to grow their AI economies whilst also driving companies to raise their standards on the responsible use of AI. In addition to that, we have been working with New Zealand on what a project that we call Reimagining Regulation in the Age of AI. And in Singapore at Davos this year, it created, uh, we released an ethical framework for the use of co by companies to help them design, develop, and deploy AI. So governments have a lot of web play, um, play uh, have a huge place to play in AI resilience and your government in the UK will start using this tool to procure artificial intelligence across the government um, uh, in next month. So companies I think also have a great role to play. So let's go to the next day, next slide. Um, and so at the leadership level, it's really important that leaders know about AI. So we created a toolkit. Go back one slide, please. We can we thank you. We created a toolkit to help boards of directors who knew very little about AI. It's in Spanish and English and will be in Arabic soon. And we're working on a C-suite version at the moment. If you want to join us on any of our work, <laughs> Uh, the uh, place to contact us is ai at weforum.org. So let's look a little bit more about the sort of resilience work that we're doing. Next slide, please. High risk use cases. Um, facial recognition is a hugely high risk um, uh, category of the use of AI. And so we have a project on that. If you want to know more about our project regarding AI in human resources, please go to the human resources and education stage at 16.30 today. That's your time, not mine. Next slide, please. Resilience in our children. Governance is really needed here because at the moment we're sort of using our children as guinea pigs and with AI, there's very little governance around it. And so, for example, we are going to be creating a smart toys award for toys using AI for the under um, sevens. And we'll talk more about that in the session on Wednesday at 1700 to your time. The standards that we've been co-creating with UNICEF will be released in July. And um, the next slide, please, which I think takes us handily into our conversation. Um, we're working with chatbots to provide care, healthcare in rural communities. But I wonder whether cash-strapped employers will want to hire fewer people and whether we as humans will actually be ready for that because we're used to talking to chatbots. We've been talking to them about COVID a lot. Um, we that familiarity and the fact that we're actually making them much better and NLP is on the on the cusp of a real breakthrough. Maybe we'll find that we don't want call centers. We're happy to talk to, to machines instead. And as social distancing becomes the norm, do we put safety first? And so are we more prepared to have robots? Um, instead of humans in our lives. So the next page, please. If you want to join any of our work, as I say, this is how to contact us. And I look for a hand back to Anthony and I look forward to our panel discussion now. Thank you. Thank you, Kay, uh, for this, uh, this uh, great starting perspective uh, on, on, on technology. And um, um, thank you also for echoing uh, the all-important uh, element here, this, this new uh, social contract that we referred to at the start. Uh, clearly, a starting theme here is we need to be working 
in all cases in partnership when we're talking about resilience. Um, so all actors count. Again, I, I remind the audience, the units here are the individuals, the companies and, and the governments. Um, so maybe going to the unit of the business, um, if we could turn to uh, Jason Stockwood, who's founder of 53 Degrees Capital, vice chairman of Simply Business. Um, and, and Jason, could you give us a few insights from the business perspective of how to build resilience going forward? Yeah, thanks, Anthony. And thanks, Kay, for that, that um, opening comment. So I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how I think that you know, the most resilient businesses over the next uh, 10, 20 years are going to be those that are mission focused, but totally adaptable to that future that Kay painted for us now. And the historical context, I think, is quite important for this. And, and then I'll just come to a couple of recommendations in the sort of five minutes that I've got. So um, I think the writer Thomas Friedman talked really eloquently about sort of three prevailing forces that are creating increased complexity and variability and adaptability of the world. That's you know, climate change, globalization, and tech acceleration. It's tech acceleration I think we're largely focused on today. Those three, um, three combinations have meant that there's an interdependence in the last 30 years that, um, that we've never known when our sort of linear brains have really struggled to keep up with. You know, that's why you know, in 2008, uh, you know, the, the finalized instruments um, uh, the housing market in the US and Florida in particular caused you know, financial meltdown for the global economy. That's why, you know, in the last year, you know, um, you know, practices in a wet market, provincial China, the whole world on hold for the last three months. And most recently, that's why, you know, a deplorable act of aggression recorded on a smartphone in the US can spark a, you know, global debate around systemic racism. You know, you know, there's three examples of how the world becomes so complex and interconnected. Um, and in many ways, you know, we haven't kept up with some of those challenges and we're living in those accelerated times. Leo Wilson, the evolutionary biologist, put it most eloquently when he said we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions and godlike technologies now. And my sense is that the, 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 in relation to business, there's two big distortions um, that we need to think about updating as we layer on this AI, the world of AI and technology that we're now entering. You know, one is the neoliberal distortion, the nature of um, humanity being, being um, reduced to economic activity and also the free market myth that's associated with that. You know, the idea from Milton from there's no other purpose in this then to maximize profit um, has really minimized our human spiritual capacities, that economic output. And I think, you know, any system that, you know, in the West, as you go out now and you see food banks, it shows that that's a system that's clearly failing on some level. And that's compounded. The second distortion is the inability of technology to deliver real prosperity and progress for everybody, you know, rather than a select few number of entrepreneurs and investors. You know, the concentration of wealth that we're seeing is completely, um, completely um, misrepresents the opportunity for us to create a fair, fairer system. You know, the idea of technology for us to liberate us all. Uh, and yet at the same time, uh, the technological acceleration that we've seen and we will see as these compound those differences in society and also to be a further blocker on social mobility. So I think there's a real opportunity in business, um, even more so in politics, in business, I think, on a more atomic level, you know, to create a vision of the future that is more hope and can deliver that prosperity and progress. And we're thoughtful around the impl implications of some of these technologies. And the good news is that, you know, these are all just systems of belief uh, that we can change and we have choices of how we change. So my suggestions um, that can build resilience in businesses and society. The first one is, is really an acceptance of that certainty as the new normal. You know, the, the way that businesses can create places of real belonging and purpose you know, focusing on trust and adaptability uh, can be a foundational opportunity to build back a better society post-COVID. It doesn't mean the planning isn't important. Adaptability, that resilience, born out of that adaptability is going to be the key as we increasingly see complexity month by month appear. You know, Mike Tyson's one of my favourite quotes. He said, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And at the moment, we've been punched in the face almost every few months now. So I think the in relation to a business, the idea is that, you know, set the mission for your business, hire a diverse organization, create an environment of trust that cage and, and then experiment towards those futures, the reality, allow people to do that work day by day and respond to anything that the business or the world can throw at you. In that context, management is often a failure of leadership 
we haven't got time to go to hierarchies anymore. The second one, and great again to hear Kay talk about this, but it needs to be human centered, but technologically enabled. Now we need to utilize technology in a way that serves all of humanity. Um, it's pretty clear that our, that, our, that our story, our progress as a species is our relationship with technologies, but we've got to remember that it's in service of our higher purpose, our own prosperity for everyone and freedoms for everyone. So as we see these efficiencies and these technologies coming, which is that we're going to have in the near term now, we've got to think about how business can serve society at large with that technology, technological accelerations. And um, so everyone needs to benefit from this, this productivity in in the uplifting property we'll get, the wealth that's created. And one of the suggestions I've made is that, you know, we need to think about employee ownership as one way of sharing that benefit and the equity of businesses. And the second thing I've written about, and we've actually trialed in Simply Businesses, um, taking that, that efficiency gains from productivity and sharing that benefit partly with shareholders and partly with um, everyone in the business to create a four-day week. And it's interesting to see, you know, in New Zealand, they're discussing that as part of their Build Back Better. And then the final one is, based on all of this uncertainty, um, you know, we have to collectively focus on individual and societal health. You know, it's become really evident to me in the last three months that the importance of focusing on that in the business I've been involved with for the last 15 years, but even more so now as we create even more complexity, even more stress, even you know, newer ways of working for everyone. Then less, you know, as a foundational level, we think about security, safety, empathy, the ability to relate to one another and care of each other, then nothing of real worth gets done in society anyway. So in relation to businesses, I think it's going to be important for people to have a clear set of values related to human well-being and human flourishing, particularly and when we look through the lens of technology and think about how we how we ensure that the world that we're going to have it through, which is going to be technologically enabled, um, benefits everyone. On the practical level, that means investing in coaching at an individual and group level as well. But I think this is really important. There are a few ideas, my initial thoughts on as we go through these changes, how we can think about a new way of working in businesses, focus on culture and technology, and hopefully out of that, given as a foundational level of resilience, they'll help to be adaptable in the future. Thanks, Anthony. Great, great, excellent, Jason. Very complimentary. And I think after a few months of confinement, we all need a bit of coaching. Uh, um, so this this definitely would be would be helpful going forward. Um, and I'll have a, a question for you, one of you, but I'll wait until all of the different panelists have, uh, have presented. We now have the academic perspective uh, from Professor James Hayton, who is Professor of Entrepreneurship at Warwick Business School. Um, James, you've heard the different interventions. Um, what would be your, your take on uh, the resilience in post-COVID-19? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I think I want to build on a few of the themes that have come up in in each of the the presentations so far, uh, touching on on opportunities and inclusiveness and dignity at work, uh, employee ownership, and so on. Let me let me make a few points, and I want to take you back to a a couple of examples uh, to illustrate them. So we know that for organisations to be resilient, they have to be flexible. Uh, they've got to continually improve their productivity by cutting costs, but at the same time, they have to focus on growth, even in a challenging downturn. Um, resilient firms are the ones that always continue to find new opportunities, both to serve their existing customers and to attract new customers and, and find new markets. So at the level of the workforce, many of the factors that support these goals haven't really changed in the last century regardless of, of whatever technological era we're in. So investing in worker skills and sharing information with employees creates trust under uncertain conditions. Providing them with an economic share reinforces a, a feeling of equity and, and commitment to the organization. And providing opportunities to participate in decisions enhances the quality of the decisions for the long run interests and sustainability of the business. And we can illustrate this by a couple of examples. One, if we go back 75 years to post-war Britain. So at that time, we were trying to rebuild the economy following a series of global scale crises. We'd had a world war, a global pandemic, a Great Depression, another world war, a series of cataclysmic economic events and societal events, of course, almost one a decade for a half a century. 
in Britain at that time, we were lagging other nations in terms of productivity. In the post-war period, we saw automation across industries was eliminating a lot of jobs and de-skilling many of the remaining jobs. And it was also decentralizing, uh, sorry, it was already centralizing decision-making, uh, which resulted in greater specialization and more repetitive, tedious work. And of course that had negative consequences for employees and we saw more turnover and more absenteeism. Um, but it also made our workforce less flexible to changing circumstances. And actually, ironically, it typically didn't produce anything like the jumps in productivity that were hoped for when we made those investments in automation. But it, there were exceptions. And in some mines, in a few mills and some of the auto manufacturers, they experimented. And rather than centralizing responsibility and specializing labor and, and de-skilling it, uh, they organized employees into uh, broadly skilled and semi-autonomous work groups. And those groups were given more voice and more chance to participate economically by being given collective performance-based rewards of one kind or another. And in those contexts, employees managed themselves and collaborated more effectively and created greater flexibility and greater productivity. And there was also notably significantly better worker well-being in terms of satisfaction and retention. If we fast forward to today, we've now got a, a large body of evidence that, that when we treat employees skills as an investment and we give employees participation in decision making and we give them economic participation through either profit sharing or, or equity share ownership, these have a positive effect on productivity, innovation and ultimately resilience. And I, I just wanna share with you a, a case. I recently spoke with a company called Kinetic PLC, and they're a specialist recruitment agency. They were founded in 1983, so they're not, not a new company. Uh, but they've always practiced open book management, and they share strategic information with their employees, and they involve them in decisions. And now it is an employee-owned company since 2018 through an employee ownership trust. And at the end of each year, about a third of the surplus is reinvested in the business, a third goes to HMRC, and the remaining third gets redistributed to the employees, divided equally, uh, regardless of their age or their position or tenure. And I, I bring this case up because Kinetic are a great example. They, they recently implemented new smart technologies for managing and planning rotors for their contracted care workers. And those workers, they're on zero hours contracts and they provide that at home care to those in need. So they've got vulnerable clients uh, and these, these important care workers on zero hour contracts, they've got to be scheduled. And that scheduling process is very complex and it was originally paper based and very labor intensive. It could take up to three days to plan this rotor. And then if there was one change, if one of the carers was absent or ill, they'd have to redo the whole piece of work. So the schedulers were spending basically all their time working on that task alone. And what the company did was adopt a new AI-based smart system. And what that did was reduce that entire three-day process to essentially a one-click process, which had built-in checks within it as well. So they took away a three-day piece of work and transformed it into a few minutes. And of course, when you're implementing something like that, you'd imagine employees to be very concerned that that kind of software implementation will eliminate their jobs. But because they had a history of transparency and trust, the management team was able to communicate to the employees what the new technology would do, that it would enhance the quality of service, which everybody, all the stakeholders really cared about. So the employees were also involved in the decision from the outset, and that included selecting the software provider and developing the software itself. Uh, and the new organization of work using that technology actually frees up employees' space considerably so they can engage in problem solving, they can interact with their carers and their clients, they can develop new business, and those things create value for the organization. And what they've seen is, of course, reduced employee turnover and, and greater satisfaction for their carers who are on zero hours contracts. They have much more reliable time allocations for those carers so they can spend more time with their clients and less time on paperwork. And the paperwork doesn't actually earn those carers any money. Um, and the scheduling team, importantly, is also more engaged and satisfied because they spend less time on boring and difficult paperwork. So they're spending time doing meaningful and interesting work that is developing new business. 
and we see the business growing as a direct result. So both groups are happier. In fact, all stakeholders are happier, right? the owners, the clients, and so on, because the system is reducing stress and costly errors uh, that, that might threaten those clients. So this is a 21st century case involving these cognitive technologies that really mirrors the same issues that we learned during the period of automation post-war. Coming back to today, we, we've got a number of surveys, as you're all aware. Recently, World at Work found that 37% of organizations have accelerated their investments in technology as a result of COVID-19. The history and the evidence agree that to get the most from those technology investments requires ongoing investments in the workforce, information sharing, and economic participation. It's not just a technological challenge. And the Institute's uh, the Institute for the Future of Work, its own survey that we released today, uh, states that there is a consultation gap, that most workers think that consulting with employees before introducing a new technology makes it more effective. But only one in three workers are reporting that their employer has actually done this. So I'll leave it to you to draw your own conclusions. But I think there's an interesting challenge, but it's not a new challenge. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to management. So thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, excellent. So it sounds like there's actually quite a few solutions which have been out there for some time, such as you know, building skills with employees, uh, economic uh, sharing within the company, um, even participating in decisions, all of these things which have been recommendations for some time, but and it's a question of applying them in, in some case um, um, to, to make it effective. Now, we have a few uh, interesting questions here that we're going to, to see to address before the break, and then we'll have another set, set of questions. Um, one, one of the important questions here is, relates to technology and to ensure that uh, technology design and application um, really works for, for humans and not just uh, for the profit, if you want, of the company. And as you said, there's a, there's a basic fear here that um, technology is, is, is potentially overtaking things, um, especially in the context of COVID-19, that we see an acceleration, as we've seen, you know, of, of further need to invest in technology in order to compete, if you want, with, 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 with other, other companies. So maybe our, our technology uh, guru, Kay, could, could, you, could you address this point? Certainly. Um, so I think that there are seven things that come to mind instantly when I look at this sort of question. Um, but the first thing I always say to companies um, when they're thinking of investing in AI is, well, do you actually need this AI application or is it just a gimmick because you think you need it? There's lots you do need, but do you need this one? Secondly, how are you going to be using this application to augment your workforce rather than replacing them? And if you are replacing them, how are you going to reskill them so you don't lose the value of the, this particular worker who already knows so much about your business? Is there a way that you can move them Look at the look at the skills that they've got. Look at the skills. Uh, look at what you need, and move them within your company. So um, I think good governance when you're using AI um, is really important. Uh, of those 175 plus principal uh, documents that are out there, there are 10 common themes, which include, of course, transparency and accountability and data privacy safety, et cetera. But one of them is beneficial use of AI. But how you get from principles to operationalization is really important to think about. And that's the bit that we work on. Um, I, and on that, I think I've got four very quick points. <clears throat> Do you need a chief AI ethics officer? Are you running AI in risk areas like human resources, for example? Um, if you're using AI, if you're developing it, then you need to think about having somebody from your ethics department or uh, in integrating a number of different jobs into the product development of the AI. Um, how are you going to educate all of your staff so they understand 
what AI is doing in your business and can help to co-create that um, governance within the company. And finally, what does your organizational structure look like so that you can involve everybody in the decisions that you're taking around augmenting using AI? Okay, thank you, Kay. So again, this issue of communication, of involvement, of demonstrating the value of AI and how it can augment workers' capacities uh, seems to be extremely important in reducing this, this fear that, that, we, that we see. Um, very comprehensive answer. Um, uh, Jason, um, moving away from just the, the technology angle, if we think uh, more, more broadly um, about um, a response approach from companies to a crisis like COVID-19, if you think of it as a, as a kind of framework, where technology might be one angle if you want, but you have others. Um, how can we, what, what are the components of that response framework that would um, allow a company to be more resilient in the in the future and align the company objectives with worker objectives so both are being resilient together if you want um so i'm not sure i understand the question there. just repeat what the question is um essentially if you're thinking about we're, we're looking to the future this is post covid 19. <laughs> the company wants to put in place an approach which is going to make it more resilient in the future, which can involve technology, which can involve approach to workers, which can involve work approaches to supply chains, many different things. The, the, the essence is what can companies do yeah. going forward to ensure that in the future they are more resilient to a repeat of something like COVID-19? Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. The, you know, I think um, I think it's central to the, the thesis that I set out, actually, which is I think if we if we believe in that accelerated environment that we live in and increased complexity by the nature of globalization, climate, as I said, technological acceleration, then actually the ability to plan in a linear fashion your strategy or how you're going to approach the it's just it's just redundant. So. You know, the, the framework that I think about is really, you know, businesses that have a, a clear mission. So a one and really clear mission statement and ability to aspire to build products and services in a certain fashion and, and make an impact on the world. At the other end, you know, hire, you know, a diverse and inclusive um, organization. And then within the middle there, I think there needs to be um, a methodology for experimentation towards that mission that isn't at any fixed point. And really, you know, what the, the role of leadership, as I said, you know, leadership, you know, in, as, as opposed to management, is going to be setting a framework of high trust, high ambition and velocity through the organization so that people can make their own decisions day to day and experiment towards that mission rather than think of a linear step by step approach towards business plans as we've had historically. So in that framework, the role of leadership changes to be clear about the mission, clear about the conditions that people operate in, but then getting out of the way and spending time um, creating a val the values of the organization, setting high autonomy, trust, and giving people the ability to master their own technical expertise in a way that gives them freedom. So that what I've seen in the business I'm involved with and invested now is the ones that have done really well through COVID or, 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 or responded better to COVID have been those ones that have had that high high amount of trust to draw on when something like this happens. It's not something you can start building in the moment of crisis and look for a single leader to have the answers for today. So I think it's a constant ability to build trust and um, be authentic and have a clear set of values in an organization. And then rather than this linear step-by-step -step approach towards a particular goal, mission and hiring the people and allowing them to express themselves in the middle piece will allow the, the businesses to have a chance of responding to whatever throws up, um, certainly better than our old hierarchical methods of working. Yeah, excellent. And, and probably injecting some of James's recommendation on the importance of really investing in skills, allowing employees to respond to different situations, uh, being more agile, if you want, uh, seems uh, impo important in, 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 a, in a context like this. I understand we've reached the end of time. Um, Nyasha, would you like to to wrap up this first part and then we'll turn to questions, I understand, uh, in, in a second part. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Anthony. And actually, just thank you very much to all our panelists, who I think did a really excellent job of setting out exactly what the opportunities are for businesses going forward, but also what the responsibilities are on the flip side. For those who really want to dig into the topic a little bit deeper, the question um, session will be opening in 15 minutes. So get yourself a coffee if you're kind of in an after, after lunch slump, or just take a little bit of time and we will all be available in 15 minutes to answer those questions. Thank you very much. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.